Welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Betty Chen. The White House has announced a 50 billion U.S. dollar investment for semiconductor research and training, establishing the National Semiconductor Technology Center (NSTC) to enhance American chip design. Stemming from the Chips and Science Act passed by Congress in August 2022, will this affect future semiconductor trends and U.S.-China competition? Joining us today are Conrad Young former TSMC R&D director and lead Agile X Accelerator founding partner, and Marco Mesger, Numando executive vice president and COO. A warm welcome to both of you on the show. Thank you. Thank Although you. the White House's announcement uh, refrained from directly mentioning China, the perceived threat to national security posed by China's technological advancements has led many to believe that the initiative is aimed at countering these efforts. So let's start with today's conversation. Professor Yang, what's your uh, perspective on U.S. commitment to the semiconductor industry at the outset of 2024? This work definitely tried to help uh, U.S. semiconductor a little bit. And uh, but I don't think will fundamental change the uh, the competition, the gap between the uh, U.S. Uh, and uh, China. Do you think that this is a critical moment for the uh, competition between China and the U.S. in the field of semiconductor, or not not a big deal? Well, I don't think it's a very big deal because uh, U.S. Uh, semiconductor industry, especially the chip design part, is still the uh, world number one in the world. Uh, and uh, the China, I think, is catching up. Uh, but they do uh, lack of uh, the capability of uh, uh, advanced technology manufacturing. So that will make, uh, make it more difficult for them to catch up in terms of the advanced application, especially the AI. So you still think that the U.S. has the edge? Yeah, I think. I still think the U.S. Uh, will keep the edge. Maybe enlarge the gap a little bit with this investment, but, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't think uh, it's not that much because the U.S., uh, all the company has a capability of invest by themselves. Marco, yeah. what's your take on this? No, I, I agree also with Conrad. So if you look at the investment, what is done there in the, in the abilities what the USA has, they have already like the largest design, IC design companies in the world. Mm -hmm. They just don't have the manufacturing capabilities. So they invest also in manufacturing, so to build up uh, like a, a home base where they can manufacture. But let's be honest, it's not possible that they will have the volume what we see here in Taiwan or in Korea or in China. But for sure, for this cutting edge technology to design this and to bring talent in, this will be very, very important for the USA. And I see, I, I don't see it symbolic what they are doing right now. They're also giving a good message to young people when they do study, right? Because this is the challenge everywhere for us in the world, in the semiconductor industry, get talents into the semiconductor industry. And so that's definitely a good ignition or like a good point uh, what they are doing to get more awareness, to get people into the education system. You talk about something very important, talent, so definitely mm -hmm. we will talk more about that mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. Do you think that establishing this center uh, will shift the dynamics between China and the U.S. competition in this regard, Marco? I would not go so far that it shifts <laughs> the dynamics, definitely not, because just because of the sheer amount of students you have in mm -hmm. Chinese uh, universities every year coming out, and Conrad maybe can highlight a little bit more about this, but definitely it's something when you think about young people maybe in the last few years, they were going more into the finance, into e-commerce, into software companies, and it's, you know, working in semiconductor in electrical engineering is like... It's a tough job, right? Mm -hmm. But you have many different opportunities. You don't need to be only in this electrical engineering, in the manufacturing. You can use your talent for finance, marketing, for all these areas. But I think the last few years have shown that this whole geopolitics, you know, with semiconductor industry, it's, it made people much more aware of this industry, which I think is great. And every small step in this direction helped the industry to bring more talents and to solve our challenges. Indeed. So talking about the importance of talents, of course, in Taiwan, we do have a lot of outstanding talent in the field of semiconductor. Do you think that by establishing this center, this will be a drive for the U.S. to develop more talent in the field of semiconductor, Professor? Well, with small uh, investment into the uh, education uh, and then the, the money into the industry, definitely you will bring the, uh, certain talent. But uh, historically, uh, 
most of the semiconductor talent are coming from overseas uh, in U.S. Uh, because uh, uh, U.S. Uh, domestic uh, uh, industry, I think, is still uh, dominated by the software application uh, that industry. So I still believe uh, most of the uh, U.S.-born uh, student would like to go to the uh, the software industry because that's big domestic market and also worldwide market. For semiconductor, because you need a certain kind of uh, uh, STEM education, and historically they are more suited uh, for most of the Asian uh, people. So historically, there are a lot of Taiwanese people go to U.S. Uh, to study and go to semiconductor industry, and uh, some of the Indian. So I think you may attract uh, because. Uh, uh, the, the, it has been a wire, U.S. doesn't attract a lot of foreign students for this industry. So you may be uh, able to attract more foreign students suited uh, for semiconductor industry. And, but I don't think it will fundamentally change the U.S. Uh, born people to, because of this, uh, going to semiconductor. If they have a chance to go to software, they will go to software. And maybe the uh, the, 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 the second tier people by thinking about going to the semiconductor, it's a possibility because it is money. So uh, regardless of uh, what I say is uh, I think the, the money does definitely help, mm -hmm. but how much it help? Uh, uh, again, we mentioned uh, U.S. already have uh, the best uh, uh, chip design industry in the world. So uh, those will attract a lot of people, but for the manufacturing, whether they can attract uh, enough people um, with this amount of money I still uh, have a certain question because it's different kind of culture uh, and uh, actually recent uh, announcement for Intel and uh, UMC uh, actually set a very good example of collaboration between uh, US mm -hmm. company and uh, Asian company mm -hmm. so if that works um, they might be more uh, close to collaboration and then to move uh, some of the the, the the Asian capability to to U.S. Mm -hmm. and that might help U.S. Uh, manufacturing uh, a little bit. Yeah. So, Professor, based on your observation, you believe that the domestically trained talent in the U.S. will focus still more on the software side, whereas maybe talents from, say, Asia or other countries may be attracted to, uh, say, the semiconductor industries in yes. the U.S. Do you agree, Marco? Um, I just would like to add one thing, because mm -hmm. we are talking about uh, traditional study and going to university, mm -hmm. but I think this will not bring enough talents into the industry. So what I've seen in the US is also they have like special programs where they pre-qualify uh, people from different industry who want to come into semiconductor, like a three months program. And when they go through, the, through this program, they can be recommended to be apply, for example, the new Intel Fab. Right, so they learn some basic things, operating a machine. So they can also come from a different industry and go in because you have different level of technical expertise you need. So I think that's also a solution where you find, uh, uh, where you can bring new mm -hmm. talents in. But I think what Conrad said <coughs> in regards to the software companies, like the e-commerce companies, I think probably the domestic people, they want to, domestic students, they will continue to look into this area. But if we only break up maybe 10% of the people to move to this, it's already helping, plus with these programs, mm -hmm. because that's the only way to do it, this will, will solve our talent issue, right? Remember, yes. we are going to one trillion US dollar business in 2030. So I think that's, it's a, it's a big, goal which needs to be achieved and we need a lot of people to, Definitely to achieve so, that. Because this is such a large industry. So now with the five billion investment in this center, um, how will the budget be used? For example, and they will be used just for equipment or how will the money be used beyond equipment, Marco? Well, I don't Talent have... or...? I, I think they are probably in different areas. So mm -hmm. I don't have the, the exact split, right? But of course you need to have, if you have labs, you need to have equipment, you need to have software, you need to have tools. I mean, design software tools, the licenses, uh, mm -hmm. you know, are, are quite uh, high investment what you need to do, but the students need to learn on these kind of software tools in order later to mm -hmm. design the chips. I think it's probably kind of a mix in different areas, mm -hmm. but definitely looking also into research, new technologies, new materials, because we need to look in, in our industry, we are 
I think since many years people say we hit a wall, right? <laughs> but now we come into angstrom area, so we come into new solutions mm -hmm. for technology. And I think if you invest money there and you have people working on this, it would be great to see also from the, from the US with this investment bringing new groundbreaking technologies. Mm -hmm. If you look at battery technology, China is basically the leader on battery mm -hmm. technology today. And mm -hmm. when they are going together like CATL and BYD to make right. solid state batteries, mm -hmm. that's a huge deal because every automotive company is looking for this type of solution. Yes. And so that's why I think we're in the US with this initiative, um, not only symbolic, it, it's also like strategic what they are mm -hmm. doing there. Again, going back to talent, as we have said earlier, Taiwan has such outstanding talent in the field of semiconductor. Do you think that this center will present an opportunity for Taiwanese talent maybe to um, show their talent in the U.S., Professor? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, for Taiwanese talent, uh, uh, the one of the problem is uh, most of the Taiwanese companies uh, think they are still lack of uh, manpower. So uh, whether they will have enough uh, leftover student going overseas, uh, uh, that's, that depends on, uh, but, but for talent, uh, basically where there's attraction, they will go. Mm -hmm. they, they, they are free to go anywhere uh, as long as uh, they can go. But going to US uh, without going to school, uh, for most of the Taiwanese uh, student, uh, directly working there, I think they might have a certain kind of a cultural uh, impact, uh, mm -hmm. language and culture. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the area uh, for for Taiwanese uh, talent want to go overseas. Uh, there's uh, the, the 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 global mentality, cultural adjustment, also language mm -hmm. com uh, communication is what we need to improve in terms right. of the education part. Mm -hmm. uh, so. So uh, I, I think there are a lot of opportunity, not just the U.S., uh, everywhere mm -hmm. in, the, in, yes. in the world. As want long to do as a there's semi a demand, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so most of the Taiwanese uh, student does have a chance, mm -hmm. uh, golden opportunity, go all, everywhere in the world, whoever wants to do a semiconductor. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing, the uh, Taiwanese industry, uh, if they want to attract the talent, stay in uh, Taiwan, they, they need to think about a different way of uh, maintaining, uh, retain the people uh, in terms of their working environment. Mm -hmm. That's the, I hope everything uh, with that kind of uh, talent competition, uh, whole industry will improve uh, mm -hmm. and then it will help the, the talent for their future uh, career also. Indeed. So talking about now, the United States contribute less than 10 percent of the global uh, semiconductor uh, manufacturing, especially in the most advanced chips. They're still lagging behind. How long do you anticipate that with the establishment of the center? Uh, do you think that the U.S. will have the chance to match with TSMC's capability in a semiconductor? Or like in other words, how many years uh, the TSMC can still maintain its competitive edge? Uh, I think. TSMC in U.S. Uh, still will have an uh, edge over the uh, U.S. company in terms of manufacturing. They are all in U.S., uh, but TSMC de definitely has a, its only uh, advantage because they have a lot of experience uh, before uh, in Asia. Uh, as long as they can learn how to adjust uh, to the culture uh, and they can use a more system approach, I think they still maintain the, uh, uh, the, the edge. Uh, it, it will be a long, uh, I would say, be a while. Uh, the way I look at it, uh, just take an Intel example, uh, I think hopefully they can learn from working with uh, UMC on this uh, special 12 nanometer manufacturing. Uh, and then really learn how, how to adjust the Asian style of manufacturing into the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. environment. And if they can do it well, I think they have a chance. Uh, mm -hmm. Intel definitely has a chance, but they need to go through that learning cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, and Taiwan take uh, uh, at least uh, 20, 30 years uh, of learning cycle to, to make a, uh, become today uh, for TSMC. So they might need uh, maybe shorter time, but, but they still need time, maybe at least uh, 10 years uh, mm -hmm. so that they can be a possible competition to TSMC. So, Professor, you yeah. say t at least 10 years. Marco, what's your assessment? 
you will not be able to nail me down on a specific <laughs> right, year number. Not. But <laughs> but I can I can share with you if you if you say before like ten percent of the manufacturing is there right now in the US, um, it's more of a question what type of manufacturing capacity you get there, right? So okay. for example, if we look at Europe, it's more like uh, um, major nodes for automotive industry, right, which is used. And then you have, for example, in the US, you have like cutting edge technology. You have two nanometer, three nanometer. So they want to get the newest one for artificial intelligence uh, to do so. But if you look, for example, building a fab in, in the USA, there was just a recent study coming out comparing 20 years semiconductor fabs building. The average time from starting to, uh, to finish it was taking around about 680 days, where Japan, Taiwan, and Korea are better than the average, mm -hmm. and the USA was at 740, something like these days, because more regulatory. And I think we see this at the moment, also with TSMC. We have TSMC, in example, they do Japan. So I, looked, I think Japan looks like on schedule. Mm -hmm. um, we see in the USA, not on schedule. And we see in Europe, right? So in Germany, there's right. also a fab. So I think with this, with this way, it's very interesting for all of us to see, oh, how does it work? to make there a new plant, right? Because this has not been done before, even for right. TSMC. Mm -hmm. They only did in Taiwan yes. and they did in China. Mm -hmm. So now they do suddenly three at the same time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I always- different cultures yes. and different environments. Yes, and I always people, wonder right? how do you make this from an execution point mm -hmm. of view, from operation, right? Because you need to have very experienced people. And I know here in Taiwan, it, it runs like a clockwork, right? So I think this is how they used to do it. Mm -hmm. But you go to another country, probably Japan, Conrad, is the most mm -hmm. similar, I would say, right? right. But Germany, USA, definitely some different. challenges, yes. Yeah. So talking about the U.S. Chips and uh, Science Act, uh, in addition to the $5 billion for the NSTC, uh, the Chips and Science Act proposed $11 billion for investment in a semiconductor. Do you have any suggestions as to how to prioritize the investment in this field, Marco? <laughs> I think it's very interesting because the companies who are getting the money are already very rich companies, yes. right? And they're getting more. So, <laughs> so I think they, they also benefit from this uh, geopolitical shift, right, in order to, to build this up. There's a huge controversy was also in Europe because spending so much money for Intel and TSMC, I personally believe is the right investment because mm -hmm. you need to see it in a very long term, right? Bring these companies in, yes, it's a lot of subsidies, but these companies, they bring a cluster of other companies also there. So I believe the investment, even for an Intel, when they get the money, let's say, in, in Germany or TSMC in Japan, help the countries to build a more stronger semiconductor industry. Because all the decades before, nobody was really looking at this and we put all our eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. That was also not healthy. So mm -hmm. I think now it's, it's breaking up a little bit, mm -hmm. it's more split. It will get more expensive, that's what I think, mm -hmm. but you have a better resilience in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions from you, Professor? Well, historically, U.S. Uh, investment, the most effective uh, way is uh, invest in uh, very innovative uh, uh, method, innovative uh, industry. So using that as a leverage to grow the industry according to, to many uh, mass production. For example, EDA, when I was in U.S. Uh, uh, back to the early 80s, uh, the, the little investment in EDA industry uh, to make uh, the whole industry become uh, very big. So historically, the U.S. Uh, uh, find the right place as uh, I call a leverage investment. So they're using the leverage to help uh, everybody uh, in this industry grow. So, so what is a critical leverage they can invest? Uh, five billion, uh, even f five billion, even 52 billion, uh, to semiconductor industry are not very big in investment. It help, but so how do you invest the right place as a leverage to help the everybody to grow? Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, I think in the in a, in a manufacturing area, they need to think about more system smart manufacturing, uh, more uh, software uh, way to help the mm -hmm. industry to do more automatic uh, manufacturing mm -hmm. with less people to get involved. Uh, with all this talent uh, shortage, I think the the AI need to go in uh, in a massive way to the to the uh, mm -hmm. the hardware industry. Okay, mm -hmm. right now 
the AI, everybody focus on uh, generated for AI, but but that's the knowledge AI uh, my, for my viewpoint. But how do you make the production AI, the mm -hmm. operational AI, and that's the another. Uh, I, I would suggest uh, put some investment, mm -hmm. so the investment into this uh, area. Right. Uh, that the AI people to help the semiconductor industry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mutually beneficial. Yeah, mutual benefit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Each nation's semiconductor strategy significantly influences global geopolitics and economics. The United States is striving to rapidly close the gap, whereas Vietnam has initiated a chip program aimed at enticing foreign firms and bolstering domestic industry. Meanwhile, TSMC's partnership in Japan is poised for imminent mass production, alongside plans for a new facility in Germany. In light of these developments, which country holds the greatest promise within the dynamic semiconductor landscape? So we talk about the new plant in, TS, uh, in Kumamoto in Japan by TSMC. Mm -hmm. What's your perspective on Japan's policy for semiconductor development, Marco? I think they've done a good job. Mm -hmm. They've done a good job uh, recently um, and I think they bring back uh, semiconductor manufacturing. I mean, we should not forget, I think the most manufacturing, f uh, the, the most factories for semiconductor are still in Japan. Mm -hmm. So, but of course, um, they were not on the cutting edge technology, right? So now we have uh, the uh, rapid, what's it called, uh, Rapidus? Rapidus? Rapidus is the one from the government initiated with some of the, uh, the big tier one companies, uh, which will do two nanometer together with iMac. Now we have TSMC uh, going there, making investments. So there have been several strategic investments. And you know, also in, in, in Japan, similar what uh, what Conrad mentioned about the USA, we have a lot of uh, high-tech companies. They are using it, they are building it, like Sony, uh, for example, mm -hmm. for the CMOS sensors. There is the demand there, and they have it also in their DNA. Let's mm -hmm. put it this way. They have it in the DNA, but it's kind. they also heavily invested only in one area mm -hmm. outside of Japan. And so that's why they have been also not be cost competitive anymore. So there were a lack of the technological experience of the demand mm -hmm. and with this initiative now and the spotlight on the geopolitics mm -hmm. I think it's smart move what they are doing and frankly speaking I believe between Taiwan and Japan that's probably the least cultural shock you can mm -hmm. have right mm -hmm. so I think it's also beneficial for, for TSMC right. and I would be very surprised if Japan would not be the most smooth investment for TSMC. Mm -hmm. So my next question is, talking about these uh, new investments in semiconductor, which country, in your opinion, holds the greatest promise, Professor? Taiwan still probably yes. number one. <laughs> Good to hear uh, that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Korea, I think, st yes. uh, at this time, still number two. Uh, Japan definitely has a chance. Uh, Japan used to be number one uh, back in the early 80s. Uh, they have all the foundation they have. Uh, there's a certain reason uh, why uh, they lose the battle during the time. Uh, maybe they spend too much effort on the quality, so cost of quality become too high, and the efficiency getting uh, lower. So, but they have a chance uh, culturally and uh, uh, with all the foundation, uh, equipment, material, all the ecosystem are there. Uh, one thing Japan need to uh, do better, I think, is their they are so-called, uh, uh, I would say, the uh, eff efficiency and effectiveness uh, in terms of uh, using the software improve improvement. That's why the, the, the AI, AI improvement to the semiconductor, I think Japan, uh, if, if I'm a Japanese company, I, I will probably, a government, I will probably do something about it to help mm -hmm. the Japan learn from the past experience uh, and to bring up to the second different level and they have a chance to learn from TSMC mm -hmm. uh, investment. Also, partially because uh, their, their, their salary, their uh, income are uh, considered is cheaper uh, labor uh, today, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, but, mm -hmm. but they do have uh, uh, one of the best uh, education system mm -hmm. in the world. So I think Japan will have a chance to recover. Uh, right. To what degree, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, the other country, uh, for example, you mentioned about Vietnam and many other countries. Uh, today, another, another story is OpenAI try to work mm -hmm. with uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, <laughs> and that's another interesting thing. Uh, I, I don't want to go in there. But any company want to initiate this uh, semiconductor industry in their country, 
I would say they have a long way to go, mm -hmm. long way to learn. I have one final quick question. Yes. Now the world has been building new wafer fabs. For example, uh, by 2024, there will be 82 new wafer fabs globally. Do you think that this trend is like beneficial to the world or is it bet detrimental? Do you think there will be an oversupply of semiconductor in the world? Well, of course, there's always an oversupply <laughs> and then there's an undersupply. That's how our industry works. Right. Because you need to spend hundreds of billions in CapEx right. and need to predict how the market is in two mm -hmm. years. You don't know what happened. War, crisis, mm -hmm. natural disaster, you don't know. That's basically what, so even with the best supply chain system, we have to deal with. But it always, you know, like the long-term trend, if you look at it, you see it's going up. And the curve is now much stronger than before. So we, we needed 60 years to go to half a trillion. And we will probably only need another 10 years mm -hmm. to go to one trillion. And that's the dynamics why we need more fabs. Do we need the number you mentioned? I'm also not 100% sure. There will always be some hiccups, but the long-term trend is pretty clear. We need more semiconductor. Professor Yang? Today is very clear. The advanced technology, we are short of uh, our capacity, but the mature technology, we, are, we have oversupply. Mm -hmm. And that's the re reality. And part of the reason is because it's easier to build uh, 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 manufact uh, mature technology uh, fab. Uh, building a advanced manufacturing, in fact, uh, uh, you don't have a technology, how, well, you don't know how to do. And that's why you still have a shortage. And because of the AI, the computi computation need, need advanced technology. So, so that, that's why TSMC in, is in a very good position uh, who hold the, the, the king of... Uh, Too bad the, we don't yeah, have a crystal okay. ball to tell us the answer, but <laughs> yeah. that's all the time we have for today. Thank sure. you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank if you, you like our show, please search for us on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe and see you next time.